Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. For this week's show, we're going to do something a bit different. Many of you know that I work with a very small group called Hubcats Chelsea down in Massachusetts. It's in an urban area right outside of Boston that has a very high transient population, and they need a lot of affordable spay-neuter services. So it's a group of about 15 people, and we're trying to help as many cats, and yes, we're also helping a few dogs to some services that they need like low-cost or free spay-neuter for cats, some low-cost services for dogs, vaccinations, microchipping clinics once or twice a year. Those are some of the things that we do. Um, We also meet as a group every couple of months. But one other thing that I do with them is I produce a TV show for the local cable channel. And I wanted to share with you this interview that I did with Dr. Bill Snell of Blue Pearl. He's an emergency veterinarian and a specialist. And I found it a really fascinating interview to try and learn about the day-to-day challenges that he has in helping animals. And I guess I should also say evening-to-evening challenges since they are open at night. And it was just very fascinating for me to try and understand his perspective and how he's trying to help animals through working at Blue Pearl. If you'd like to see the video of this interview, please check out our TV channel at www.hubcatschelsea.com. Click on the drop-down menu header blog and you'll see the link to the show or you can search Hubcats in YouTube and it's episode number 10. Feel free to enjoy my other shows that are listed there too. It's really fun being in the camera, and it's been a great experience uh, trying out something new and looking forward to doing a few shows in 2019. I do hope you enjoy the show. I don't believe I've had an emergency veterinarian on the Community Cats podcast, so I thought you folks would be interested in hearing from him this week. I'd also like to thank Laura Appleton, who is my co-host on the show, so you'll hear her voice. And thank you to Chelsea Cable for letting us share it with all the listeners. And, And again, I do hope you enjoy it. Feel free to share your comments with me. Email me at stacy at communitycatspodcast.com. Also, don't forget to mark your calendars for January 25th through 27th for the online cat conference. Just go to onlinecatconference.com. We're putting together a fascinating listing of speakers. I'm so excited. And I really hope that you plan on joining me there that weekend where we marathon the weekend through with all things about community cats. I hope you enjoy today's show. I hope everybody had a great Halloween and I hope everybody is going out to vote. Vote early is the easiest way to do it. I just did it last week. Take care and enjoy, and I will see you next week. Bye. Hi, I'm Stacey LeBaron, and this is another edition of Chelsea Hubcats. Today, we have Dr. Bill Snell from Blue Pearl Vet in Charlestown, Massachusetts, right next door from us here in Chelsea. And he's, uh, and also joining us today is Laura Appleton, my partner in crime with these shows, and um, It's great to have her. She's our Chelsea Hubcats Outreach Volunteer. Chelsea Hubcats is a nonprofit organization that was founded about a year and a half ago, actually almost two years ago, to focus on the needs of cats within the city. We assist with free spay-neuter programs, vaccination and microchipping clinics, and rescue for cats and dogs. To date, we have assisted more than 1,200 cats and dogs from Chelsea. That's 1,200 over the last two years. I think that's a pretty impressive number. For more information about our organization, you can go to www.hubcatschelsea.com or find us on Facebook and join the team to make a difference for cats and dogs. Our phone number is 857-776-2287 and our email is hubcatschelsea at gmail.com. So please reach out to us if you have any questions. We're here to help the cats and dogs in Chelsea. But on today's show, we'd like to focus on emergency vet care and specialty care Many of us, unfortunately, I have, have situations where we have had to have our pets um, go to emergency care. They're in dire need of help. Today, we have Dr. Snell here to help us better explain the work that he and his team does over at Blue Pearl and what we can expect from a trip to an emergency room and an emergency veterinarian. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. 
So uh, before we dive in with Blue Pearl and what the work is that's right there, can you tell us a little bit about your own personal background and how you became a veterinarian? Sure. Um, so I was actually born up here in Massachusetts, but grew up in New Jersey. Um, I wor started working at my first veterinary hospital when I was 13. Uh, a friend of mine uh, had a father who was a veterinarian, and he was nice enough to offer me a job. Um, I what think were I you, what were you uh, what were you doing? Oh, I was working in uh, I was working actually just in the kennels there, which was a terrific kind of first experience mm -hmm. for a 13 year old trying to you know get their feet wet so to speak and. Uh, I think at that point I always thought I wanted to be a veterinarian, but clearly you kind of have to <laughs> earn your keep. Exactly. So um, you know, I worked at a few hospitals after that, um, kind of always moving up a little bit, doing some nursing as the years went by, and then obviously I went off to undergrad. Um, still had the passion, and was lucky enough to get into vet school. And following vet school, you know, did my internship, and then you know, tracked small animal. Um, small animal surgery and became a small animal surgeon. So it's kind of been a, uh, a trajectory that started at 13 and has landed here now. And it's been a lot of fun along the way. It's been a lot of work, but it's been a lot of fun. It's a lot of hard work. And um, I actually am involved with the uh, Shelter Medicine Committee at Tufts Veterinary School. Oh, that's and awesome. one of the things that has changed a lot over the course of the last 10 years or so is the amount of exposure that students get for surgery. When for you were sure. in veterinary school, were you able to have a lot of exposure with surgery, or was that something you had to learn after you graduated? So it's kind of a company. It's been a uh, you know hot button topic in veterinary medicine throughout the years, um, and so I would say yes. It, you know, during my time in vet school, certainly we got to do a good amount of surgery, but a lot of the more technical procedures, you know, are not usually done as a student. You get to um, scrub in and watch, you know, boarded surgeons a lot, but you're not actually doing a lot of those procedures when you're in vet school. Um, it isn't until you kind of get out that you start to, you know, involve yourself in some of the more technical surgeries, um, which is why a lot of times uh, f some of the more technical surgeries are being done by boarded small animal surgeons, and so hence the reason I decided to go on and do an internship and surgical residency because it was something that I enjoyed most about veterinary medicine. So. Um, Bill, Dr. Bill, I don't know. So, um, small. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, small animals, uh, sure. um, uh, what they, they, they include? So, yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, obviously when you're going through veterinary school, your practice isn't limited to dogs and cats. When you're going through veterinary school, all the exams following are, are um, geared towards most animals that you study, and those pri primarily being dogs, cats, horses, cows, pigs, sheep, and goats are probably the, the main animals that you learn about in vet school. But usually once you've finished vet school and sat your, your national boards, you kind of make a decision to track large animal or small animal. Um, and for small animal, primarily most practices are seeing cats and dogs. Um, certainly some exotics will fall into that. You get a lot of pocket pets and exotics that, that a lot of general practitioners will see. Um, now there is subspecialization in, in, in exotics medicine. Uh, people who do specifically that sort of thing. I think Tufts Veterinary has, mm -hmm. has an exotic specialist over there. So, um, so primarily our hospital is, is cats and dogs. Um, exotics being not a ferret, so. <laughs> I mean, ferrets are seen, can be seen in small animal practice, but they are also, you know, they're also considered an exotic as well. So, ah. so I would say, you know, a lot of exotics would be like ferrets, but reptiles, even, you know, birds, things of, of that Parrots nature. Parrots and, you know, sure. um, pool con uh, gray conures. Um, uh, a wildlife? Um, usually is a, is a separate service. So, uh. I mean, through the, through our emergency service, certainly at times wildlife will come into the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, there's certain licensing that sometimes can be required to deal, you know, full time with wildlife, but we're certainly willing to do whatever we can for the mo you know, the animal that particular mm -hmm. moment. Yeah. Um, oftentimes we try to work with um, veterinarians who specialize or are geared towards wildlife and have the appropriate licensure to deal with that. And then rabbits. That's the only other mm -hmm. group we haven't talked about. Rabbits. Yep, certainly. And, um, you know, I think rabbits tend to be kind of a case-by-case -case basis. A lot of ER doctors are very comfortable with rabbits. Um, from a surgical standpoint, usually, you get, as far as the anatomy is concerned, it's not, it's, you know, there are some differences and there's certain um, from your, you know, cat or dog anatomy, but um, especially orthopedics, some of the anatomy is relatively similar. Um, the anesthesia becomes the technical part, so you really want to be have, working with people who are very comfortable doing the anesthesia on those sorts of patients. But. Mm. 
-hmm. let's talk about what what happens at your emergency clinic. I mean, what are the, sort of the scenarios that that you see? Are you open only during nighttime hours, or and like what kind of cases walk through the door? Sure. So the our emergency hospital is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, holidays year round. Um, Staffed by staffed yourself by, in... Staffed by an ER doctor at all times. Okay. Um, for me, as a boarded surgeon there, I, you know, my hours are weekly dependent, but, um, but we are, are, I should say, our emergency surgical services are always staffed by myself or any of the other three surgeons that work between uh, the two Blue Pearl hospitals. So usually if something's coming in through emergency and it requires surgery, you're always going to get a boarded surgeon who's going to be doing the surgery. But to answer your question in regards to the ER service itself, um, the ER doctors that are there, and whether we're talking about Waltham or Charlestown, there's a different set of ER doctors, but they all um, are terrific. And there are always, is always an ER doctor who's in the hospital 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Hmm. And so I would assume, you know, in the cases that, that I've dealt with with regards to emergencies, I mean, we've dealt with hit by car animals. Sure. We've dealt with... Um, neonatal kittens or bottle babies, mm -hmm. you know, failure to thrive scenarios, uh, you know, FIP cats, uh, you know, you can, I can, my list can be very sure long be, yeah. over, you know, all of the years, but from your perspective, um, you know, if, if I have a cat at my house, I mean, what are the certain things, cat or dog or animal of any kind, what are the things that I should sort of go through in my mind to say, I really need to bring this animal to an emergency vet? That's a great question, and I think obviously it always depends a little bit on the timing of day as well. Um, you know, I mean, you make a great point. A lot of people think of emergency as being in after hours, but certainly at times, emergency can be during the daytime as well. One of the important uh, messages that we try to say from, from Blue Pearl in, uh, in particular is that our goal is to work with the referring veterinary population um, kind of as a resource for them. Um, we always encourage, unless you, uh, unless you know outright this is an, a blatant emergency that needs to come right through the door, we always encourage that you contact your referring veterinarian first. And if they think that it's something that they want to see right away, fine, have them have, you know, going right. through your vet. If it's something they think that you, you know, they think that you need to see the emergency service for, then they'll point you in our direction immediately. But you're always more than welcome to call if you have questions or if you're not able to get a uh, hold of your vet, just call our, our staff because our nurses, our well-trained nurses, or our ER doctors are gonna get on the phone and basically ask you a series of questions, you know, trying okay. to suss out what is going on and whether this is something that is emergent or not emergent. And that's something that they're always prepared to do 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And what sort of equipment do you have? Do you have like um, oxygen there? And sure, yeah, so we have multiple different oxygen tanks, obviously, um, fully equipped operating rooms, um, all the necessary, really, equipment that you'd need to treat any small animal emergency. Certainly, we're not, we're not set up for any large animal stuff, so right. horses and cows and sheep and goats are, it's not our, not our area. Right. Um, I would point or chickens, <laughs> chickens. <laughs> or chickens, for that matter, I would, usually are not coming in through our door. Primarily dogs and cats, rabbits and ferrets, that sort of thing will be, will be the types of animals that are walking through our door, but pretty much everything we have set up for uh, for dealing with any sort of emergency. Yep, all the appropriate monitoring equipment. Um, as far as our surgical ORs, they're pretty much set up for everything from your general emergency cases all the way through your, you know, your specialty emergency cases that involved minimally invasive procedures like laparoscopic and thoracoscopic stuff as well. Um, you know, we also work with, or well, we have um, a, st a staffed ophthalmologist at our Waltham Hospital, um, and she has all the equipment she needs to deal with, ocular emergencies and things of that nature. So, um, yeah, I would say pretty much any emergency is something we'll be able Bring to Bring it on. Pretty much. Yeah. How long have you been in operation? Um, the Charlestown Hospital has been in operation since this past November. The Waltham Hospital uh, became Blue Pearl Hospital a little over four years ago. Ah. Um, and so it's been exciting for the new to have the new Charleston Hospital because the Waltham was getting very big and is and is doing wonderfully and that was kind of the um, encouraging aspect there and that's what kind of spawned the mm. Charleston Hospital. Hmm. I'm just trying to think through uh, different scenarios. Have you ever had an, an emergency situation where um, you know maybe there was a fire in an apartment building or anything like that where you've had to triage multiple cases or even you know a flooding situation or something like that is that an emergency response is that sure. something? I mean I'll, oftentimes um, 
fires can be very, very serious. I mean, number one, dealing with patients that have any sort of burns, but also, two, dealing with the respiratory distress factors, carbon monoxide toxicity, and things of that nature that come along with fires. And so, yes, um, hence the reason it's a well-staffed ER with, uh, with well-trained nurses. Um, and like you mentioned, oxygen cages and such, all the appropriate labs that we need to run in-house, laboratories and um, for you know blood gases and things of that nature to kind of decide how emergent and, and what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, fires is probably the, you know, probably the number one where you're going to see many cases all at one time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was trying to think there was a, um, um, a permanent building, I believe that um, Carol, who does a lot of trapping mm -hmm. for us in the area involved in Lynn, I want to say maybe within the last year, there was a fire in uh, an apartment building. Mm -hmm. She had been trapping, trying to get whatever cats that might have been able to get out of the building. She was trying to trap and, and, you know, get whoever was left. But I can only imagine, you know, with animals left in the home during yeah. a fire that it would be really terrible. And, you know, people don't know where to go at that point in time either. Exactly. Um, and so the doors are always open for people to just, you know, come on in. And especially in an emergent situation, I think, you know, one of the things that you can expect when you walk into an emergency hospital, similar to how it would be in a human hospital, is you're going to walk in oftentimes in a panic and our front desk staff is trained to kind of mm -hmm. deal with that you know, right. panicked moment. Oftentimes what's going to happen is one of our ER nurses is going to come out and assess the patient immediately, or at times, depending on how, you know, how the patient looks, it might be a very quick assessment and just right back to a doctor mm -hmm. uh, in the treatment space to be able to get oxygen onto that patient or monitoring equipment, so on and so forth. And that can sometimes be the scariest thing for owners is you know, they're coming in with their pet, they don't know what's going on. They're very, very scared. And then, you know, a nurse comes out, and two seconds later, their animal's no longer in their hands, and it's back in the treatment area. And that's, you know, yeah. it can be scary. Like, what just happened to my? Where, where did they go? And I think what you know is important to recognize is the nurse usually did that because they're trained to assess certain factors in the triage that make them alarmed, and they're removing and bringing to a place where we can get appropriate monitoring equipment mm -hmm. on, and appropriate. Um, intravenous access if needed to give IV fluids or oxygen in front of the patient depending on what's going on. So these are, you know, oftentimes when that patient leaves you, it's going to a place where we're trying to start treatment to have the better successful outcome. Yeah. That actually makes me think we should reach out to um, the Chelsea Fire Department because I know there's a fundraising campaign that's going on to make sure that the fire departments all have oxygen that's appropriate for animals. Yep so that then they can assist animals. So no, I think that that would be that. really important to make sure that the communities in the area would have that. Um, um, so um, hypothetically, if you, um, if anybody in Chelsea uh, witnessed a dog or a cat um, uh, unowned, mm -hmm. I don't know, because offer said, Texera mm -hmm. said, <laughs> uh, frequently these uh, cats and dogs are owned, but they have a wide jurisdiction of, you know, right. uh, the Chelsea area. But, you know, if, if I um, hypothetically um, witnessed uh, um, an animal injured and I said, oh, I don't know what to do. I'm going to Blue Pearl because it's uh, close and um, um, it's available 24 hours a day. Would you accept this patient? Um, Absolutely. So, I mean, part of our jobs is, you know, obviously a lot of our, obviously a lot of our clientele, these are owned pets, but yeah, there are yeah. always going to be those scenarios where a good Samaritan brings in a pet and, you know, we're always going to do our best to try to work, you know, especially considering what's going on with the patient at the time. If it's a perfectly healthy patient, then we're going to at least assist in trying to identify whether there's a microchip there and then help you contact shelters if, if need be to try to find a, you know, a basically a route for that patient to be, be homed. Um, alternatively, if there's something that's going on where there is a medical issue, it really is going to boil down to, you know, what the medical issue is, how serious it is, is there a microchip, is the patient owned, can we contact the owner? But our, our ER doctors are all trained at least 
trying to get the process rolling, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I have staffed some, some veterinary clinics um, in the past, and we always uh, check for chips yep. under, uh, uh, under uh, all um, situations. But if the cat, in this case cats, uh, has a chip, it's uh, dicey if the uh, um, owner is found you sure. know, it, because um, it's right. a potentially uh, a chip from New Jersey, or yeah, you know. Sure. So I'm you know, like, <laughs> and the owner Nothing against New Jersey, I, I, you know. I, I said hypothetical, but uh, the, the scenario. But you know, I'm thinking, you know, um, we tried and tried, and you know, the information yeah. was found, and right. the uh, former only owner didn't pick up. So yeah. And there are times where these things happen, you know, and, that, and in those scenarios, and obviously we're working with trying to find a shelter that's willing to work with them. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then also there's the case, too, where you're looking at the animal, the cat or the dog or whatever, and, I mean, if they're in severe distress, you have to address the needs of the animal, too, because exactly. you don't want them exactly. to be in a situation where they're suffering, just waiting for a phone call back. Yep. And, I mean, without, you know, RER doctors traditionally are, you know, always going to at least start some level of treatment care and mm -hmm. pain medications just off the bat, just to make sure what it, if this is something, you know, say a patient was, uh, you know, a, a, a stray was hit by a car or something like that, and there's a broken leg, they're at least going to be starting some of the supportive care and pain medications, trying to make sure that patient is at least comfortable while we make some of these decisions and try to find out where ownership lies and so on and so forth. So. Yeah. Well, I, I'll take the conversation a little step farther, we'll talk about euthanasia. So obviously, you know, in an emergency scenario in any clinic, sure. you know, offer euthanasia services. Mm -hmm. um, and I would assume, obviously, you know, your folks are all trained with regards to counseling and helping folks in, in yep. making um, that decision. But that is another part of those emergency services. Absolutely. Absolutely. Euthanasia is, a, is a, always a hard topic to address. Um, but absolutely, it's always it's a very real aspect of veterinary medicine, and and it's a very real conversation that you know not only R E R services but also a lot of our other specialty services uh, deal with. You know, when in our Waltham facility, we have a uh, you know extensive oncology mm -hmm. um, service there, uh, and you know obviously they're dealing with this a lot. Um, thankfully, as a surgeon, I don't have to deal with it as as frequently. Right. I mean, not to say that it it doesn't occasionally come up, but you know. It's not nearly as frequent in my in in my area of subspecialty, um, but it's a very real aspect of veterinary medicine, and it's and it's a hard topic to have. It's you know depending on the disease process, it's always going to be a part of the conversation, especially when you know as veterinary medicine has become so advanced that a lot of our patients are living longer and and they're developing various different types of cancer, and now the chemotherapy is so prevalent, you know, um, and they're being treated uh, for much longer for this, you still reach, just like in people, there's always going to be a time periods where there's hospice or end point, and having that conversation can always be tricky and challenging of knowing when the appropriate time to have it is, absolutely. So you said your specialty is small animal surgery? surgery. Um, so I'll ask the thoughts, are you, do you do pediatrics, spays and neuters? Oh, uh, absolutely, Good. absolutely, <laughs> yep. <laughs> so yep. yeah, I mean, traditionally for, at least for Blue Pearl, um, our, our goal is to work hand in hand with the referring community. So we oftentimes are not trying to do the surgeries that are commonly done mm -hmm. at, uh, at a lot of the refer our referring veterinary hospitals. That does not mean we don't do spays and neuters there, uh, you know, upon requests, especially if the referring's sent over for me, you know, I do a lot of minimally invasive surgery, so laparoscopic sorts of procedures will, are, are areas of interest for me. And I do, you know, periodically get requests for laparoscopic space some you know, and of that nature. Um, hopefully as, as time goes by and I have an opportunity to do more relief work outside of, of this hospital as we kind of grow it, um, especially in other countries, you know, where, you know, the spay neuter populations mm -hmm. are, are all in as much need, you know, I'll be mm -hmm. doing a lot more of that work moving forward. but. You bring up a great point. There's a lot of that need here as well. So we were talking about before we came on set. So there's obviously a great amount of need that, for that as well. Right, right. Um, so just to define for the folks listening, laparoscopic, what does that mean? Sure. So laparoscopic is, um, let's put it this way, anything with the end scopic <laughs> is going to have some level of camera involvement using small ports 
to then put our instruments and our cameras into various different cavities. So for instance, laparoscopic would be in the abdominal cavity, thoracoscopic in the chest cavity, arthroscopic in the knee or the elbow or joint cavity, so on and so forth. But basically, as opposed to making a, a, a larger incision and a big open approach, it's several smaller incisions where a camera is inserted in to be able to visualize and then instruments are put in through various ports to do the procedure in a less painful, minimally invasive sort of way. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. I mean, I've had, we had a cat once um, at the Merrimack River Feline Rescue, which had a lot of, um, she had like a lot of growths up in her nasal, okay. you know, a lot of those, yep. and they had to go up and take, take yep. them out from Rhinoscopic, there. so yep. rhino meaning nose, scopic with a camera, yep, absolutely. Yep, so that nowadays in veterinary medicine, there's cameras for a lot of different purposes. Um, yeah, and one of the nice things is Blue Pearl has pretty much all of those cameras. All of the, all <laughs> so. of the equipment. So then, so we're talking about the specialty component sure. now about Blue Pearl. So in addition to wearing the emergency hat, you wear a, they, your staff has a specialty hat. So exactly. a standard veterinarian may refer somebody to the specialists at yes. Blue Pearl? Yep, so obviously having two hospitals, we have some overlapping specialties and then we have some specialties that are unique to each respective hospital. Um, and so traditionally, you know, bring up a great point, you know, our emergency service is you know, wide as far as the Charlestown and Waltham um, services are concerned um, and they're they're dealing with pretty much anything that walks through the door on an emergency basis. Um, but before they would have a case that they would transfer to the specialty service, they would always call that veterinarian and say, hey, so and so, right. you know, we have one of your patients that's here at our hospital. Um, you know, this is what's going on with it. Is this something that you would like to have back and kind of treat moving forward? We've stabilized this patient. Right. Or, or is this something that you would prefer that we send on to one of our specialists? And that's kind of a very important feature of Blue Pearl anyway is the fact that our goal is to make sure that the referring community is as involved with their patient as we are. Um, but obviously whenever a specialist gets referred a case, um, you know, they would always keep in contact with that veterinarian as well to make sure that we're all tied into the same loop. Um, as far as the Waltham Hospital, you know, we have, uh, I mentioned oncology already, cardiology there, ophthalmology, um, several radiologists, um, and then our internal medicine specialists um, our critical care specialists that work hand in hand with our ER service to make sure that the ICU is 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 helping out, and then obviously you know surgeons as well. And so, uh, as far as our Charleston Hospital, we're a bit newer, and we're you know we're we're just opening up. So some of the main services that we have there are critical care and ER, and then surgery and and internal medicine specialists as well. Um, we will have ophthalmologists and cardiologists who will be doing some time with us as the summer approaches here with the full intent of having all the same specialties as, as Waltham in mm -hmm. the future. So. so you do like ultrasounds for cardiomyopathy and we that do. kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. Dr. That's Pierce is our cardiologist at our Waltham hospital and she, um, she does all of our echoes, yeah. Okay. And um, one other thing that we see a lot is um, thyroid issues with cats, mm -hmm. the radio cat and that, is that? It's a good question. So we don't do radio iodine therapy at this time. It's something we've talked about. Um, and Dr. Chartier, who's our Charlestown internal medicine specialist, and Dr. Barry Spielman, who's our Waltham internal medicine specialist, both have discussed interest in it. The question will be is, you know, when and if we decide to open up that sort of practice. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a very good point and it's a very good treatment for that disease. Uh, so I do think it'd be probably worthwhile looking into. We've discussed it for sure. Yeah, yeah. If we see references to it. Mm -hmm. There's an a mm -hmm. email group that has all like 600 rescuers yeah. across Massachusetts and it flares up pretty, uh, flares up every now and again. We'll see that and a lot of uh, diabetic conversation. Yes. Um, yep. Sometimes heart cardiomyopathy, you know, um, comes up. I'm trying to think of other case scenarios that come up on, on mass cats of <coughs> what, what we run into. You know. I, I'm sensitive to um, injuries. Um, a lot of injuries, uh, yeah. Not a wound of uh, unknown origin uh, and quarantine for rabies. Um, yeah. uh, typically, the cat is um, um, limping, so. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, the challenges of trapping the cat and sure. you know getting the, the cat caught caught out there and, and that kind of thing. Um, in terms of what what's the strangest case you've ever seen? 
It's a good question. <laughs> it's a really good question. <laughs> Strangest case I've ever seen. Um, you could most, most memorable. I mean, there's, there's been several different types of cases out there that have been strange over the years. I think anything that involves... Um, anything that involves maggots of any sort is always an interesting sort of case, and if people always cringe whenever you hear that sort well, of thing, yes. we, and we just yes. did, sure yes. did, we just did. Um, uh, you know, we see, you know, especially as a surgeon, we see. For me, the things that are, you know, are some of the neatest cases are not always what everybody else seems to be the neatest cases. So I really mm -hmm. enjoy surgical oncology. So some of the tumors that I, you know, that I've removed have always been very interesting and fascinating to remove, but. It also always astounds me what dogs eat. Oh. <laughs> so, and, and I think there's been you know, Nat Geo television shows about what the, what what dogs have eaten. But mm -hmm. that, those are always interesting to find what you're going to pull out this time. So yeah. probably the most common ER surgical scenario is 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 a foreign body in a dog. And so these are mm -hmm. things that we're mm -hmm. we're constantly pulling out. But you know we you know we get various different unusual cases. And as far as penetrating wounds. Um, you know, bows and arrows, things like mm. that. Mm. Um, oddly enough, I've had a dog that ran through a glass door that was normal after it ran through the glass door, and several weeks later, all of a sudden developed a very large and inflamed leg, only to find out that there was a six inch shard of glass that was just stuck in his triceps muscle that it took us a. Oh, you know, wow. Oh. Took some imaging to kind of figure out what exactly was there, but it obviously went through the laceration very quickly and it sealed up very quickly and then just had this piece of glass in there. So, hmm. yeah, very unusual. So, um, I think I'm, I enjoy my job because there's always a surprise, which is kind of nice. Something, right, something, <laughs> something new. Um, yes. I was wondering if you have um, a capability of lab work, blood work, and pathology on site or you would need to send it out Good question. So, you know, as far as our in-house laboratory, as far as running all blood work is mm -hmm. concerned, um, yes, that's always on site and is, you know, most commonly used by especially our ER doctors that need stuff like right away. Mm -hmm. um, as far as um, a pathologist for reviewing mm -hmm. um, like cytology, which is looking at individual cells or mm -hmm. histopathology or biopsy results, for instance, um, that stuff is usually stuff that we send out mm -hmm. um, and get a clinical pathologist or um, you know, to, to kind of give us an opinion. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the lab sample. Mm -hmm. um, from a surgical standpoint, a lot of my cases, you know, that I've seen on appointment don't need the blood work back that day. So oftentimes that blood work is sent out, but the ER service is frequently using the in-house lab for the emergency cases, like you pointed out, you know, fire, patients right. that are having respiratory issues, you need to get a blood gas back right away. You don't have time to send that out to a lab. You need to have in-house lab mm -hmm. work for that. Mm -hmm. And especially, and also our internal medicine service, which is oftentimes doing, um, you know, seeing, like you said, your diabetic cases, they want to be able to track that sort of stuff and do blood glucose curves in-house and so on and so forth. So there is obviously a need for a certain level of laboratory inside, but a lot of the clinical pathology that we'll, we'll end up sending out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, does Blue Pearl, or, or have you had any experience in dealing with feral cats or trap neuter return? So the so Blue Pearl itself does not do much in in that way as far as primarily involved with it. A lot of our doctors do as you know on the side. Mm -hmm. They'll work with various different you know spay and neuter clinics or shelters, or they'll do this as you know part of their uh, international work, so on and so forth. Um, obviously we will get some feral cats that come into the hospital through ER that somebody, a good Samaritan has brought in. So, um, and depending on the case, you know, we may work with, you know, with that person, especially if they're going to decide they're going to adopt the cat, work with them to try to make sure that that's done for them, something mm -hmm. along those lines. Right. But your staff knows what an ear tip is and, mm -hmm. you yes. know, having cats identified sure. and, yep. and that kind of thing. And, um, and in general, you know, would be supportive of the concept of trap new to return for community cats and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as a way of helping to control overpopulation. Absolutely. I, uh, you know, being part of an emergency clinic and, and, you know, it's not the cheapest, you know, it's, it's expensive. Veterinary care is expensive. It is. It's very challenging. And, and, um, for a lot of people to, you know, just even to pay their rent and, or to even afford to get their cat or dog spayed or neutered, that's, that's why we offer free spay and neuter sure. services. So, you know, it's a tough conversation because I know the staff at Blue Pearl, you know, you didn't sign up to become a veterinarian, you know, just to get the bills paid. You sure. signed up to help animals. Yep. And my understanding also is the veterinary field is very stressed 
There's high rates of depression in the veterinary field. Mm -hmm. It's very emotional. It's very tough. You know, compassion fatigue, you know, mm -hmm. is, is rampant. So there's this, this challenging dance where veterinarians are out there caring. We're out there caring. Yeah. The money's just, the bridge of that money is just not, not there. You know, can you solve that problem for us today? <laughs> <laughs> today. <laughs> it is a... Um I think we're seeing this as a giant challenge in veterinary medicine now, and I think it speaks volumes to um, you know to the work that you guys are doing with the free spay and neuter clinics to be able to solve some of these these big issues that are out there. Um, you know, as far as as far as solving the financial issue, I think you know there are services that we work with. So you know, at least in our hospital, if somebody comes in and cost is a factor, and we've you know exhausted um, all options as far as um, them to speaking with family and friends, so on and so forth. There's certainly always care credit, which mm -hmm. is something they can apply for, but not everybody has terrific credit. Right. Um, and so, you know, sometimes that care credit's not going to cover the cost of the services. Other services that are that um, that we do work with is something called Frankie's Friends, which is a donation base. So, you know, for a lot of your viewers out here, um, you know, if you stop into the hospital and see and read about Frankie's Friends, it's, a, it's an ability to donate funds for these people that have scenarios where um, maybe their patient has a very good prognosis, um, but they don't have the funds to be able to get the treatment that they need. And oftentimes they are, you know, there's a process to be able to access these funds. It has to do, you know, with the management of the hospital and, and the doctor who's overseeing the case and the prognosis of the patient, so on and so forth. But oftentimes, you know, if, if this is a very good prognosis for the patient and the owners have gone through and they're, you know, declined for care credit, so on and so forth, then Frankie's Friends can be an option. And so, you know, not only is it an option, but it's always something we're always looking for people to know about so they can donate mm -hmm. and, and help in these scenarios as well. Um, but you're absolutely right. I think that, uh, you know, to go back to the emergency factor of things, you know, we already said that, you know, somebody in an emergency scenario walks into the front door, they're already stressed out about what's going on with their patient. And then all of a sudden, you know, they meeting a doctor in the middle of the night, somebody they've never known who's gonna tell them, um, you know, a bunch of things about their patient that are scary and then they're going to present them with an estimate that is probably not what they're expecting it's going to be you know it's, right. you know emergency medicine is not it's not cheap right. but we do our best and i think all the doctors that i work with are very responsible at at trying to do what is needed you know what are the diagnostics and treatment options that are needed to get to the source as quickly as possible um, you know, when it comes to medicine, you know, our, you know, our goal is to use your, you know, the, the client's history and our physical exam findings to create a list of possible differentials and then recommend diagnostics that will help whittle that down to what is the correct diagnosis and then therefore treatment option. And so it's a process. And so when we're constructing estimates and trying to put together a plan for your patient, we're doing the best we can um, with the information that we have and trying to take the shortest route to the diagnosis mm -hmm. and treatment plan. Um, and so, you know, it's, it can be scary for owners. And yes, I, do I have an answer for it? Mm -hmm. No, veterinary medicine is certainly increasing in costs. And, um, and um, I think it, like I said, I think it speaks volumes to your work as well, mm -hmm. because there needs, there always needs to be both sides of it. And yes, while we need to pay our bills, it's also our responsibility as veterinarians to remind ourselves that we also have to do our outreach stuff as well. And that mm -hmm. may not always take place through, you know, through these respective specialty hospitals, but usually it's work that we're doing on the side with various other communities. So that veterinarian that you might see when you go in is, might also be doing their own side work with mm -hmm. other, you know, shelter medicine groups or, you know, outreach groups in, in some way, shape or form. So. Right, right. No, it's, it's incredible challenge that the veterinary community has and I you know it's in the sheltering world I mean the, the whole mm -hmm. compassion fatigue conversation is it's very hard because your hours are long they are long and then you're saying oh well and then you know, on Sunday I'll come in and I'll do a you know a community cat clinic and do yep. surgeries and I mean it's the pretty much only the person who has like the I would say the spay neuter addiction which yeah, there yeah, are yeah. some veterinarians that it's less like a day isn't a day without yeah. spaying and neutering or without doing surgery. Yeah. It's uh, it's very interesting to see that personality because it's they have to feed that almost on a daily basis, and um, and so they're they're there doing that. But it but still then they don't know how to take that break. Sure. You know, and I've seen that enough with staffing shelters and you mm -hmm. know foster care, the foster homes that don't know when to say when, and you know situations when they when they get out of control. And I mean that's 
that's another, um, you know, scenario is, you know, do you have pets at home? I mean, I know some veterinarians have quite, quite a few pets. I do. I have two, I have two dogs and a cat. Um, I'm finally getting to year one of our puppy who's finally going to be a year old. Oh, so, so you had a puppy. Um, so that's like 10 times. Yeah. Yeah. I am a sucker <laughs> for an old dog. Um, uh -huh. And so I have an 11 year old mixed breed dog that I've had since vet school. And, um, and we had lost her brother about a year ago and then and then we uh, adopted a puppy uh, after after my my previous dog Louie passed away and his the new puppy's name is Tucker and he's almost a year and he's finally starting to listen my wife is starting to do some agility stuff with him which she <laughs> seems to really enjoy um, but he's he's doing great he gets along with my 11 year old great um, we have a cat that was raised by my two dogs Oh. Thinks it's a dog, yeah. So he gets along really well with the with the with the puppy, and they seem to just spend a lot of time running around the house after each other. So uh -huh. it's keeps yeah, them busy. Have, exactly, exactly. So several pets at home. I think that's usually where I call my limit, though. Two dogs and a cat is is plenty in one house for, nice. for for me anyway. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, with all the all the work and yeah. everything too. To your point about the financial stuff, though, one of the other things that is probably good for people to start looking into if they are having, um, you know, one pet or more than one pet is, is insurance that is becoming a, a, a more real factor and is making, at least from a veterinary standpoint, it's making our lives a little bit easier because, you know, if, you're, if you have insurance on your pet, that is something that, uh, you know, depending on the plan, most insurance companies in veterinary medicine anyway seem to be doing a really good job of, of insuring, especially against those emergent scenarios that we kind of discussed before, which mm. takes a lot of the pressure off both the client. I've as spent $5,000 for a week's yeah. care of one of my cats yep. at emergency. It takes mm. the pressure off of you when you see that estimate. It takes the pressure off of the you know, veterinarian as well, mm -hmm. where we're doing the best we can to work with whatever the finances are that are there to try to get the best care. And oftentimes, the best care can be limited by the finances that are available and so if that is not as much of a burden then we can do the best we can to kind of get the best outcome. Do you have any sense of what like a monthly payment would be for care credit? For care credit or for, for insurance? Or for, I guess for insurance, I Yeah, guess. I was going to say care credit is, it is as a separate commodity or is, is usually something where there's a bill and then there, you know, the and then they're just paying yeah, they're off paying the bill. Yeah, they're paying it off like okay. a, like a, so like a, a credit a, card. So care credit's a one-time thing. Yeah, you and apply for care credit. It's almost different. like a, yes. So, you know, care credit would be would be applying for essentially a credit card. Mm -hmm. um, and then it would, you know, you get X amount and and you'd be able to use that for the expenditure on, on whatever the, the bill is for the hospital So that's stay. if I'm standing there and I've got a $2,000 estimate in front of me and I'm going, oh my God, I don't have this. And then you go and you run care credit through real quickly, sure, whatever. And, they, and then uh, all of a sudden it's like the, you know, the, 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 the retail credit card comes up and says, oh, congratulations, <laughs> you've got a new credit card and you, we just put $2,000 on those there. Lines. And I would always defer to my front desk staff, who's the yeah. ones who really run this, yeah. you know, and, and they know the ins and outs of everything. Um, but care, that's how usually how care yeah. credit works. And yeah. then you would pay it off like you'd pay a credit card off versus insurance, which is something that obviously is more advantageous to take out when you have a puppy or a kitten because they're younger and usually your monthly payment is less than, you know, clearly if you have a 10 year old dog that you suddenly decide you want to do insurance on not to say that it's wrong to take out insurance at that point but the insurance premiums are going to be clearly higher at that juncture so it really depends on the age of the patient on what the monthly payments are but if you have a puppy puppy's pretty risky that's <laughs> it's that's true it depends i yeah. mean how many and puppies don't eat something that they shouldn't that's eat? very true so and those oftentimes you know the uh the the foreign body surgery that is stuff that would be covered by most insurance companies as long as you've had that insurance for whatever their time period is before it becomes in effect obviously when it just like in people um when it comes to insurance you always want to make sure that you're you know, reading through what the coverage plans are mm -hmm. what are the you know are there any congenital issues for the breed that you're talking about that they're not going to cover so you have to be smart just like you do in human medicine mm -hmm. um in regards to what insurance plan you're picking what insurance company you're picking to make sure that you're picking something correct for you and also for the breed of this particular patient that you that you um, you know so certain certain breeds are predisposed to certain things that may not be covered by certain plans so do you have any uh, thoughts around the issue of um, like homeopathic or holistic treatments sure. veterinary treatments I mean I think that there's a lot of literature that's going into them these days um, for me I'm a pretty strong proponent of acupuncture therapy and there is some great acupuncture um, veterinarians in the area uh, that I work 
pretty closely with. Um, as far as some of the other holistic approaches that are out there, it's hard for me to comment on you know, some of the Eastern medicine. It's just not my area of training. Mm -hmm. I always say um, to owners that it's absolutely fine with me if they want to investigate these sorts of things or even use them. I worry sometimes when it, you know, there's certain Eastern medicines that are being used that I don't know what their drug interactions are with some of the Western medicines that I'm using. And so I always have a little bit of a concern in those yeah. scenarios. Um, but I think it's a really good option to have out there um, as, you know, as is physical therapy, which is another big part of veterinary medicine that you're starting to see more and more rehab places and PT programs. Uh, my wife's a human physical therapist, so um, mm. so you know, mm. hearing her perspective and the, and how much that helps um, treat human patients and accelerate their recovery is really important. And we seeing, I think, we're seeing a lot of that in veterinary medicine as well. So with the um, the PT and like water therapy and that kind of thing, I mean, I would never see a cat like in the water doing yeah. water but dogs you would right yeah. and i mean there are cats that do it and and you know for for me you know i think that there is you bring up a great point in in water therapy i think water therapy is a fantastic way to to rehabilitate certain patients and does that always mean you have to do it uh you know with a certain water treadmill uh no there's other ways to do water therapy as well there's pools you know that certain hospitals will have to do it there's mm -hmm. also doing it on your own in, in in ponds and so on and so forth so there's ways to get animals in the water that may help with those arthritic old labs that I'm a sucker for. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, no, there's, uh, you know, especially post-operatively, we, you know, we do a lot of orthopedics, especially uh, between the two Charleston hospitals. We do a lot of orthopedic surgery. We do a lot of knee surgery. Um, and a lot of these patients uh, benefit greatly from, from working hand-in-hand -hand with physical therapists to help accelerate their recovery. And is there a physical therapy location that's we use whatever is convenient for the locations that are convenient for whatever owner we're dealing with. So oftentimes we have lists of physical therapy facilities in the area and mm -hmm. we just kind of choose whichever one's closest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, before we switch on to sort of our local announcements that we usually do at the end of the show, I didn't know if there was anything else you wanted to make sure that we shared with the Chelsea community about what's happening at Blue Pearl or sure. what you're hoping to see happen, maybe specifically where you're located and how people can find you. Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, the hospital's location is at 56 Rollins Street. Um, it's, you know, kind of on the Somerville, Charlestown borderline there, right by the Sullivan, um, Sullivan Circle. Um, you know, the hospital has been open since November, but the staff there has known, many of us have known each other for a lot longer than that. Um, we really enjoy working together and we're excited to grow the hospital. It's, um, you know, we built the hospital bigger than the amount of staff that's there now with the anticipation of adding specialties over the years. And so basically just, you know, keep an eye out on the hospital for as we add specialists. We also work hand in hand with our Waltham Hospital and some of those specialists there. Um, but overall, it's, um, it's a growing and very excited team to be servicing an area of Boston that, you know, doesn't have a giant, uh, you know, specialty hospital in the area. And we are very excited to work with the referring veterinary population in the area that seems to be doing a terrific job. And um, a lot of us have been going out and meeting them by going out in the community and just um, popping in and out to some of the veterinary, veterinary hospitals and meeting a lot of veterinar veterinarians in the area. And so we're just excited to work hand in hand with them. Um, um uh, before um, Blue Pearl and Charlestown, um, the community was served by which emergency services, uh, primarily MSPCA Angel? Angel, yep, down in Jamaica Plains, and then um, MassVet uh, referral up in Woburn, and then obviously our other hospital of Waltham, which yes. was Waltham located. So you kind of had three hospitals trying to service that area, um, uh, kind of a around Boston, but now this is going to be the first one that's right down in the area. Mm -hmm. So and you have parking? We do have parking, yep. And close to public transportation? Close to public transportation, very good point, very good point. <laughs> Those are all the yes. key questions. All the key questions to ask, yes, you can take the T is, right there as well. Uh, I believe the it's the orange line. line. Okay. I believe it's the orange line, yes. That's great. And did you share a phone number? Um, I did not share okay. a phone number. Or, um, or his website, just to look up the website? Sure. Is that the uh, best way to go? You can look up Blue Pearl Veterinary, mm -hmm. um, and you'll actually have access to all of our locations. We are um, at, I might have to edit this out because I <laughs> did That's not. Fine. Six one, the phone number is 617 
uh, 284-9777. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would just type in Blue Pearl into Google. Yep. Um, would probably be the easiest way. I think it's uh, bluepearlveterinary.com. Okay. Um, I can double check. I usually access the other one. It's my blue. It's Google. <laughs> Google is great. It's probably the I best mean, way to do it. I have a feeling that's how I found you. So yeah, fair enough. It's uh, it, it works out that way. Um, so thank you again for for, for coming. Me. And um, we just have a few announcements for just keeping folks up to date. Not, not much has changed. We do our usual routine. Yes, um, um, the clinic was this weekend. You have numbers? Yeah. I, at this point, the estimates are around 200. Mm -hmm. um, we had some great photos um, contributed and some video. So mm -hmm. if you check out our Facebook page at Hubcats Chelsea, um, the Facebook page has some video from the, from the event. Um, so we had a, a successful vaccination and microchipping clinic um, that we offer free for cats and dogs. We do that twice a year in the community um, and we even had some giveaways some doggy giveaways and cat giveaways and all that kind of stuff and the weather was good and our next one is going to be in October I believe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to say October 24th uh, 21st 21st yep next clinic is October 21st and um, so keep keep on coming we're now at the point where we're cycling through enough animals so we're able to do the three-year vaccines um, so that's good. I don't know if you have any comments on the benefits of vaccinating fewer amounts of time versus annually. I'd be honest with you, that is not my area of specialty. Yeah? <laughs> I, can, I can't think of the last time I personally gave a vaccine. Gave but, a rabies um, vaccine. I, we'll get you out there to one I of those know, clinics. I know. I mean, <laughs> you know, as far as our hospital is concerned, we have rabies vaccines available because the scenarios right. in which we're usually giving them is usually post post bite wounds, yep. um, but we rely heavily on all of our referring veterinarians to kind of advise right. on titers versus vaccines and so on and so forth. And I, I know there's a lot of different schools of thought on that. Mm. Um, so I usually point people towards the referring veterinarian. So, well, I, and I won't go into the non-surgical <laughs> non sterilization conversation, which is happening in July. Yeah, there's a big so conference yeah, coming so up exciting. in July in Boston. <laughs> nice. And uh, yeah, so it's that'll be fun. It's a, it's a really interesting talking about community cats. If we didn't have to trap all the community cats yep. and spay and neuter them, if we just had to like trap them and just pop them, yep. you know, and that would be great to help with reducing our cat Absolutely. overpopulation on the streets. But then there's the whole problem and they're doing a session on identification too. So mm -hmm. how do you identify a community cat if you're not able to tip them? Sure. Because visually you see that a community cat's been spayed or neutered with the ear tip. But if you don't have that because you don't have to anesthetize them to do the surgery, mm -hmm. then how are you gonna identify them in the future so that then an animal control officer is gonna know this cat's cared for, somebody's feeding it, it's been spayed or neutered. You know, yep. I don't have to worry about it so much. So it's, it's an interesting conversation. Sure. Um, I think in Massachusetts, uh, the ear trip is pretty common, but uh, in different parts of the United States, they uh, tattoo. So mm -hmm. some, yeah. some do tattoo still, yeah. But I think ear tipping, but I mean, there are some parts of the country they like ear tip a boy on the left and they do the girl on the right. And there's other parts where if, the, if they've tested the cat and it's tested positive for feline leukemia, they tip both ears, which amazes me. Mm -hmm. um, but people have their own interesting language about how to identify community mm -hmm. cats, which is, is very different because we should all speak the same language yeah. across the country no, with regards to identifying our cats mm -hmm. so that people know. Um, as you see pretty much on every show, I put a, put a plea out asking for volunteers. Um, we're always looking for help with fundraising volunteers and also with trapping. Um, we meet at the Chelsea Police Station um, on the second Tuesday of the month and um, at 6.30, so you can always reach out to us and find out when our next meeting is and you can please, please join us and check our website for details. Um, anything, Laura, do you have anything else you wanna add for today's show? I think you have the basis. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else from Blue Pearl? I think we should all go do a field trip and check it out More than welcome. And, and visit and see, see what's up and uh, spread the word. Um, I, you know, Thank you. I'm trying to think it probably the, the trip from here to there would be 20 or less minutes or yeah. so. 
where if you tried to drive to Jamaica Plain from here, a you'd be in over <laughs> an hour, especially if we're doing rush hour. Yep. Mm -hmm. So if there's an emergency, you could save some lives if people know about you. That is the goal. And so please, for folks in Chelsea, please spread the word for um, about Blue Pearl, the fact that there's an emergency service clinic so close by. Um, it's, a, it's a phenomenal resource. Um, and I want to thank you, Dr. Snell, for thank joining for us me. today. And mm -hmm. Laura, as always, thank you. Um, and so to donate to Hubcats Chelsea, you can always go to www.hubcatschelsea.com. Find us on Facebook to help join our team and make a difference for cats and dogs. Our phone number is 857-776-2287 and email us at hubcatschelsea at gmail.com. And thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. And please remember that no cat will be left behind in Chelsea. And I will also add that we will also help the dogs too. So thank you so much. And maybe I'll be adding rabbits. I don't know, maybe we'll <laughs> add rabbits someday but, and exotics, but um, we're here for the animals. And so thank you again for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Community Cats Podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes, leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats.